When I think about the New Silk Road, I think about three key routes. I think about the China Middle East route, uh, which is a very important one. The second Silk Route that I think is important to remember is the general, the GCC Asia Silk Road. Uh, now this is a, it, this is a growing relationship. Uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council states in Asia, paved by trade, tourism, the flows of people, capital, and goods across this region uh, is extraordinary. The third Silk Road is the Silk Road that we talk about when, this is the Silk Road that generally the State Department thinks about a lot, and this is the Central Asia uh, Afghanistan uh, Silk Road. It's probably the first time in the world since, again, since the end of Middle Ages, since the end, since the beginning of the Renaissance, where we have an area of the world where the Western world has limited presence. And the Indian Ocean, for me, to a certain extent, could well be uh, sort of the Mediterranean Sea of the 21st century. The capital of flows coming out of the Silk Road or the Middle East or Asia are obviously huge and important. They are still largely, I would say, being intermediated through the West. So they are largely being intermediated through the London and the New York financial centers. There are some gateways that are being built. Dubai is one. I think Istanbul will be another. Hong Kong and um, Singapore have built gateways. And I think if the regions along the Silk Road are successful in building these gateways, um, I think that will, uh, that will change the dynamic quite a bit, or will accelerate the dynamic in terms of the growth around these Silk Roads. There are also um, significant problems to the, to, to the Silk Road, at least in this area, uh, realized, being realized. First of all, there is the problem of Afghanistan. It hasn't gone away, and it will not go away. In fact, the stability, future stability of Afghanistan as a, as, a tra uh, as a transportation and energy corridor is open to question as much as it's been uh, before. The other big uh, uh, question marks here are Iran and Pakistan. Uh, there is a whole different set of security dynamics uh, that's going on, the nuclear issue with Iran and uh, the collapse of, in many ways, relations between the United States and Pakistan. China is encountering more problems in the Gulf region, in the Middle East, especially with Iran. Uh, it's a country that has promised a lot to China, but has not delivered a great deal. Many big projects have been put on hold. Uh, negotiations have to be reopened uh, all the time. Unsurprisingly, the custom uh, union now with Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine, of course, under the control of Russia, show the way Russia wants to play by extending its natural connections around the country. One of the issues that the sovereign wealth funds face is the size of their savings, which is what China faces as well. The, the, the numbers are so big that they have that it's difficult for the new Silk Road to absorb. So as much as I think China would like to invest in you know, Indonesia or in India or, or in or the Middle East or insofar as Kara Holdings or Adia or any of these guys would like to invest, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars that they, that they earn every year. Um, the, the countries at the moment just cannot absorb those capital flows, so they end up in U.S. Treasuries. What we are definitely seeing is that uh, there is a very clear uh, economic movement into this space. Uh, there are not only new opportunities, but it actually is going to have a big impact on, on relations between countries in that region, and then uh, will have a, a big impact on uh, the global relations. So one of the risks really is about this ability to sustain growth for the next 25 years and to face this demographic explosion that uh, relates to India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and many others.